All right, just bear with me one second. I just uh, bear with me one second. I just uh, How we doing, fellas? Good. Good. Um, we can go ahead and get started today. Let's get um, Nathan, if you wouldn't mind leading us in prayer, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Uh, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be a world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, um, so, uh, hey there, Matthew Mick, long time no see. Okay, um, yeah, your audio isn't coming in super well, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to try something a little bit different today. I was watching... Um, I was watching the Today Show, and some of you guys may have heard of, may have heard of what I'm about to bring up. But um, you know, this is going to go into being part of our warm up. Um, on the Today Show, they were um, talking about possibly using drones, right? Using drones to. Um, they're talking about using drones to uh, end up um, detecting coronavirus. Raise your hand if you heard what I'm talking about. Uh, Freddie, can you tell me a little bit about that or tell us a little bit about that? Like what, what are they detecting? How are they, how are they being used? Well, apparently there's like a, a drone that can detect coronavirus. I don't know how, but I just saw that, that they're like using a drone in a hospital that like just, um, he goes around and just scans like everything, and then like it could de it could detect coronavirus. That's what I've heard. Yeah, that it can that it can um, end up detecting uh, coronavirus. Um, good. So, uh, not not just that it can detect coronavirus, but that it. Um, what, what sort of symptoms um, in people can they detect these drones? Fevers? Yeah, it, it detects, it, they can detect your temperature. So you could be walking on the street and then a drone comes down 
and tells you that you have a high temperature and that you need to go inside or that you're too close to somebody else. So there's all sorts of um, questions. What would, be the, what would be the big issue with that, what we're discussing? Makai, what would be the big issue with that? I mean, why would people have a problem with that? For, for me, I just wouldn't be comfortable because, like, it's pretty much, like, drones controlling our lives at this point. Okay, so I think what you're getting to is the issue of privacy, right? Mm -hmm. that if you, you know, you don't want to have to worry about, if you're going outside, you don't want to worry about, um, you know, con being, being uh, approached by a drone, telling you, telling you what's going on in your life and what's going on with your body temperature and all that. Yeah, Josh Davis. What if you have a fever and you don't even have coronavirus and it just takes you, that you, uh, they're saying that you have a coronavirus because you have a fever? Yeah, so these, I, 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 you're, you didn't come in super well, but I think what you were saying is, is these drones, they're they're reading they're reading basically temperature on your forehead and they're saying um, based off of that what you know what your temperature is if you're over if you have a higher temperature and they don't they're not telling you whether you have coronavirus or not they're just saying that they have a, that you have a high temperature and we know that a high, having a high temperature is a symptom of coronavirus it could also be a, a symptom for a million other things so I think that's um, I think that's the idea. But what I want to get you guys to do, and if, and if you would, just go ahead and, and mute your video, because I'm going to, I think it's better. We tried doing a video um, in class in person yesterday, and it didn't work super well. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you a YouTube link for you to watch on your own within the next two minutes of class. I've also provided you in the chat feature um, a Google Doc, okay, and in place of a warm up about World War One, because we've done plenty of those, I want you to answer um, the question on the Google Doc, and that is, is it okay, or would you have a problem with a drone going around and um, and essentially either telling you to stay away from people or telling, uh, telling other people that, uh, or t telling you that you were near somebody who had, who had coronavirus-like symptoms. There's all sorts of things that go into play for that. But just tell me what your opinion is. I would like you to write down a good, um, at least four lines of, you know, just good, solid, I wanna see your opinion and I wanna see the rationale behind your opinion. So here's the YouTube link. And I know that there's been a couple of people that have gotten in since um, I, I posted the, um, the warm up, uh, but I will also, uh, I'll also post the YouTube or the, the warm up link again um, in case you didn't have that. So again, put your, put your video, put your uh, camera on mute, um, go to the YouTube link and see what it is they are discussing. All right, Freddie, don't Freddie and Makai, you have not watched that YouTube video yet. You guys need to go on and, and look and see and just consider this question up here after watching the video. Okay. So I understand that you guys have uh, probably opinions on it now. Just watch the video and then and then do that. Here's here's the Google Doc again, Matthew Mick. I think you're a little late. So so there's there's the um, there's the Google Doc link if you need it to edit that Google Doc and just do what the other guys are doing in terms of um, editing your specific area.
Okay, you should be coming towards the end of that video. I'm gonna, um, and, and you should be writing at this point in time. Remember four lines, I'm looking for four lines here. Okay. Um, if you're still writing, uh, just wrap up your thoughts. Um, you know, hopefully you've made it to, uh, you've, you've gotten enough down. Um, let's look at what some of you guys had to say, because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. And if you've got something to say, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, first of all, is there anybody who would like to share maybe their statement on it before I just start reading? And also I'll remind you guys, those of you without videos on who have had videos in the past, you better turn them on. All right. Well, we haven't heard from Matthew Mick in a while and I'm sure Matthew Mick has an opinion on this. Let's see what he has to say. It is an invasion of privacy and our rights as according to the First Amendment um, to peacefully assemble. Um, interesting that you chose assemble for that. Uh, with using the drone technology, the government would, uh, would also be able to track our movements and activity throughout the day. It's a mass surveillance. Um, Matthew Mick, why did you choose um, peacefully assemble? How does how does a drone tracking movements um, um, inhibit our ab ability to peacefully assemble? By your estimation. You can't just invade I mean, people might not want broadcasted and hanging on following them around or 
would you have a barbecue? Would you want to just sit in there, watch your family and everyone else? Okay. And it's uh, just that, a thought. Yeah, that's, thought. That's, an interesting, that's an interesting point. So um, you bring up the point of a barbecue. And I think what a lot of these, um, I think what either China or well, let's say the United States, because we don't live in China, and China does pretty much whatever they want for their own people. Um, Mick, could you mute, mute yourself? Including so kill them or send them to concentration camps. Yeah. So uh, could you just go ahead and mute yourself real quick? It's uh, I th I'm hearing my own voice in the background. It's throwing me off. Um, so um, as far as as far as the United States is concerned, they would say our, our government would say, well, we would do that on public property. If you're walking down the street, if you're you know in town, that they wouldn't do it in in the privacy of your own home um does that make you feel better or does that make you does that not make you feel better what what uh, what's your reaction i mean I, I i still don't think that i just i don't like it personally i don't like the the thought of someone on the other end of a camera watching me throughout the day or even just seeing me um, when I'm in public or wherever, I just, I don't like it. it. It's surveillance, really. They're using the drones as an excuse to keep tabs on, on people. And it's, that is not freedom. Okay. That's surveillance. That's control. Okay. All right. Um, Those are, that's my thought. So. All right. Good, good point. Good point. Um, is there somebody who feels a little bit differently that these would that the, that the drones might actually be be helpful? Um, we'll go Zane and then we'll go Trey. Um, I said that they would be constitutionally appropriate as long as they were um, in public places, like. Even if you don't agree with them, they don't against they don't go against the constitution because they're not in your house. So, like, if you were um, not social distancing, but you were in your house, there'd be nothing they could do about that. But if it was the federal government doing it, they'd probably need permission from all the states because in most states it is illegal to fly a drone out of your line of sight. Um, let me ask you this, Zane. Um, so, you know, Matthew might respond to that by saying, well, they might not, might, might not be doing it in the privacy of your own homes now, but who's to say that that wouldn't get abused in the future? Um, hopefully, if that did happen, someone would take it to the Supreme Court, and then they'd look at the Third Amendment, which says something about the privacy of your own home. Are okay, you, yeah, that, you that's the right to privacy in your home. That has to do with quartering of troops, but I, I, I see what you're going with that. It does have to do with privacy. Um, Aaron O'Neill, you've got quite a bit here. You mind if uh, you uh, turn your video on and, and we can go ahead and read through what you're saying here. And so I'm just going to read it. And if I and if there's anything that you missed, just feel free to supplement it. If if the country has a lot of coronavirus cases, I think it is necessary. Oh, I'm, I forgot about you, Trey. We'll get you after, Trey. Uh, that it is necessary, but if the country does not have many cases, I don't think people will need the drones to look over their lives and to tell them what to do. People are going to violate the social distancing requirements if they feel safe enough anyways, and those drones do not need to look over them uh, if, they do not, if they do feel safe because uh, most likely they are safe then. The amount of money it would take would not be worth it, especially with the amount of case, with the low amount of cases we have. So to, uh, ha to have the amount of surveillance, what I'm, re what I'm seeing from you, Aaron, is to have the amount of surveillance that, uh, that we would need, it would cost too much money, just given that we don't have uh, a, a super, at least in Virginia, a lot of cases. Yeah. I I just feel like in the United States in general, like we don't even have like one percent of the population that ha that has coronavirus. Uh -huh. I just don't feel like it's needed, and I honestly don't know anybody with coronavirus personally. Mm -hmm. So I just wouldn't feel like it'd be needed in the United States, but like in other places, like maybe 
Italy, I knew, did have a lot of cases. I don't know if they still do. Like, I feel like it would be necessary for them because, like, almost, like, their, like, whole population has it. Yeah. Or maybe, like, I don't know how many China has now, but they did have a lot. So, like, it might have been necessary in the past. In the United States now, we actually have the most cases, but we also have a, a much larger population than, say, Italy or Spain. So, yeah, um, that, that, that you have to consider that as well. Trey, did you have something to say? Um, basically what Aaron said, like, if a place has, like, a high, a high, like, case of corona, then I think it is very effective there. But, like, in small places that really don't have it, there's no need for the drones, because the government would just be wasting money for no reason. Okay. Um, Nathan Howerton, you want to put down your phone and maybe give us a little bit of input? Uh, well, I think the use of drones like could help because like obviously like China's cases have gone down a lot more. Uh, so clearly they're working at least a little bit. So I think if we did use them, it might help, but only if they got to a certain point where we had to use them, you know. But also, like, they would have to stay on pu public property or else it would be, like, a violation of our rights. Yeah, so, you know, they, clearly a difference between – I mean, but even then, you know, there are certain things. So, for example, if the drone has the ability to determine what your, temp your body temperature is, do you consider that to be private information? Um, kind of, yeah. That would be kind of private. I mean, but, like – it would still help with the numbers. I mean, I wouldn't really mind if a drone was looking at my body temperature, you know? Let me ask but you this, and this question can go to anybody, Nathan, you can answer it too. Is there anything the government is doing now that we could consider a violation of our rights, but we're okay with? We've kind of talked about this before. Mm. I can't really think of anything that would be. I don't, I don't know if, like, this is, like, a law or a right, but, like, I know in North Carolina, at least, like, some people that have houses down there or, like, own them, they can't go to them right now. Because, and I, I just feel like that would be, like, unfair because they own the house. Like, they should be able to go to their house. You talking about beach houses? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't see how that, like, really changes the difference from getting corona. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, and to go along with that, think, what executive order is kind of di dictating the way we live our lives right now? What's um, the executive order that Trump put in place? I, I don't know. We have to stay in our homes. Yeah, travel. Well, no. When we gather, how many people can we get together with? Oh, Ken. 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 Can you imagine if the government tried to do that when there was nothing wrong? Yeah, we'd be comparing that to North Korea, right? So I think like there are there are sacrifices you make in a time of crisis, but there even even with those sacrifices, there is a line um, in terms of you know your rights and 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 your wherewithal to protect those rights. Any other thoughts on this subject? Cool. All right. So I've got your warm ups. Um, Howerton, I like how you made it onto the fourth line by one word. Okay. That was, that's always impressive to me. Okay. That's a very Nathan Howerton thing to do, I feel like. Um, so um, good on you. Okay. That's full credit. Uh, so uh, what, what I'm going to do is we're going to uh, wrap up the last section of notes. Before we do that, um, I should tell you that we do have a test um, scheduled for tomorrow. You have all day tomorrow to take it. I'm going to make sure that it's, I'm, I'm going to send you a link on your emails tonight. If for whatever reason you do not get that link, okay, or you do not get information on the test by tonight, that means that there was a problem with your information, right? That there was a problem with something that was communicated to you. Do not assume that the test was not scheduled or the test was not handed out, okay? That's bad news bears for you because you're gonna end up, you're gonna end up being the one staring down a zero on your test grade with 
uh, about three weeks left in the quarter, okay, which is not ideal, all right? So um, let's, uh, let's look at the last bit of notes. Uh, the test will cover all of World War I. I'm gonna stop sharing the warm up right now, cool. And we'll, we'll start sharing the World War I PowerPoint. All right, so first of all, where did, Trey, what, what, give me something we discussed last class. You talked about Wilson's 14 points. Oh, good. Wilson's 14 points. Um, Nathan Howerton, get off your phone and tell us one of those 14 points, please. So, uh, one of the points was uh, there, there can't be any secret treaties. Okay, I was hoping you could recall it off the top of your head. That's what I'd expect from a student with a 100 in the class. Oh, well. All right, uh, so good. No secret treaties. And why no secret treaties? Why did they not want secret treaties, Nathan? Uh, because it would, that would ultimately lead to, like, uh, uh, different countries, like, forming, like, unions against other countries, probably. Okay, well, that was the whole reason World War I started, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Freddie, what was one other of the 14 points that we had discussed? Like the ocean, like no one could own the ocean or like ship, something like that. Freedom like of the can't... seas, good, yeah. And what was, why was that an issue in World War One? Because Germany was using submarines to, to sink down like trade things, trade boats or whatever. Okay, Mackay, give us another one. Reduction of arms. Yeah, reduction of arms, reduction of armaments. That's the one that you brought up uh, two days ago. Josh Davis, give me another one. Uh, free trade. Free trade. Good. So um, he, he brings these fourteen points to the table. This is the actual document, okay? Or, or you know, the actual what it was word for word. We simplified it a little bit. I'm only, I'm not requiring you remember all 14 points, but we did get through each one of these. And we added to this, and the biggest of the 14 points was this last one, the League of Nations. Aaron O'Neill, what was the League of Nations? Um, the League of Nations was... Uh, Did it have something to do with like the Treaty of Versailles? Versailles? Treaty of Versailles, it, 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 was, it was a big part of the Treaty of Versailles. But what physically was, anybody, what was the League of Nations? Was it? It was like um, the United Nations. Kendall, the, Kendall, go ahead. Big Kendall Tiller. Wasn't it like, um, like, uh, US, I mean, not U.S., but different um, leaders of countries joining together. Yeah, different leaders, different leaders of countries uh, joining together for the purpose of what? For the purpose of... Uh, of what? For the purpose... Uh, uh, you do know it. You're, you're about to say it. Kendall, you always feel like you don't know what the answer is, and you're always about to say it, and I can tell you're about to say it, and then you just stop talking, and I have to get, I have to call on someone else. But I, you know what? I'm not calling on someone else. Why? Why did? Why did they want all the leaders coming together? Like so they can win World War One. Yeah. Or at, at the very least, avoid war. Okay, so you didn't know at that time, but oh well. Uh, so yeah, so they could so they could avoid um, they could avoid war altogether. Um, good. So that was the biggest one, and what he's going to do, and I think you guys got this last bullet. Um, he left DC uh, for Paris to go negotiate terms for peace. So let's uh, did we get this? Yeah, we got all this. All right. So t uh, terms of the treaty were harsh. They were signed in 1919. And we're going to talk about what made this treaty such a raw deal for Germany. We see here the guy sit, uh, seated here. 
This is the German ambassador who is being forced to sign this document by the other great powers at this table. Um, and we're going to see, so we're going to look at why this was so harsh on, why it was so harsh on Germany. And the biggest reason, what got the German people so upset, what got the German leadership so upset, was that Germany had to accept the blame for the entire war, for the entire conflict. Mackay, was it was it that was it Germany's fault that World War One took place? No. What, what started World War One? What physical act started World War One? The assassination of um some Ferdinand, right? Yeah, Ferdinand. Good. In in a tougher question, who di who did that? Which country, or people within what country? France. Nope. Someone else. Oh, wait. You know it? I think it's Austria-Hungary. You're, you're warmer. So Franz Ferdinand was from Austria-Hungary. Where was the assassin from? <laughs> Russia? Russia. No, no, no. Serbia. Serbia. Ah, He's going to be from Serbia. And so if anybody should be taking blame, maybe Serbia, okay? But they're not going to say t Serbia has to take blame because Serbia is on the side of the allies, right? So um, they, they unfairly said Germany had to take all the blame for the war. But the fact of the matter was that, you know, countries like France and Great Britain, they wanted blood. They were real upset. This was a problem. You know, what... what um, you know, World War I, it, it killed all these men. It, 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 uh, it led to a bunch of land getting destroyed. So France wanted Germany to make, be made out to look like the bad guy. So remember, they, lo they lose 13% um, of their territory, and that includes the region of Alsace and Lorraine. And let's see, guys who may be able to remember back to the third quarter, what was the significance of Alsace and Lorraine? Why mention that? That, that name should look familiar to you. Because uh, they took it from France when Napoleon got uh, suppressed back down. Close. So remember Napoleon's nephew, yeah. Napoleon III, lost the Franco-Prussian War to the Germans, and what did Germany do? That was Terrell Owens taking the football, putting it on the Dallas Star, having that treaty at Versailles, or having that uh, uh, the treaty uh, conducted at the Palace of Versailles, just like this treaty is being done, and taking. Alsace and Lorraine from France. So one of the first things France wanted, we want that territory back. That is historically French land. Uh, Germany was wrong to take it in the first place. Um, and the next bit, and this is bad too, they ended up making Germany pay really, really bad war reparations in the amount of about $55 billion. Now, at a certain number, you know, who really knows what uh, 55 billion is worth back then? I can tell you that it's probably, if you are to think of that, about that in today's dollars, think of it in terms of, of, of several trillion. You getting this, Freddie? Okay, just making sure. All right. Uh, so, uh, re restricting the size of the military. Military could not go over uh, 100,000 people. Um, Remember, Germany had the biggest and the best military before this point in time. They said, okay, you can't, you can't mobilize. You cannot get your army together. You cannot um, move your army around at all. And not only that, you, you can't produce over a certain amount of war materials. Only enough, uh, very, very, very little. Um, so these three things were just devastating to Germany. These were things that just kind of destroy Germany's economy. And remember, Germany no longer has a Kaiser. Um, they got rid of their Kaiser 
uh, to take on what type of government after World War One? Democracy? Yeah, to take on democracy. So they are now a democratic government. But think about it, Trey. Think about the shape that this new democratic government, it is, it is, is it even really going to have a shot at being successful uh, with this type of stuff uh, levied as punishments? No. No, I, I'd agree with you. It's, it's not. So it's going to have its work cut out for it. And so it won't be surprising then when we see um, the German government end up failing. Not only that, but they're going to lose all their colonial holdings. We talked about their holdings in Africa. They also have some um, colonies in the Pacific. And you're going to see the map of Europe redrawn. You're going to see Poland end up being created as a country um, by itself. That was old German territory. Um, and you're going to see the Ottoman Empire. Remember, whose side was the Ottoman Empire on? Wasn't it, was it Germany side? Yeah, they were on the German side as well. So they get punished by completely just getting chopped up a lot like this picture shows with Germany right here. And um, they end up losing all of their Middle East territory besides the country of Turkey. Um, all that's going to go to, uh, is going to be divided between Britain and France. Now, uh, follow-up question. Why are those European countries going to take a special interest in the Middle East? Oil. Oil. I heard somebody say it. Yes. Oil. Yes. So, um, you know, what had been the resource they had been using to power, to power things before oil? Wasn't it like, like, coal, oh. whale, blubber, whatever? Oh. Okay, so that was, so you're going way back, Trey Braxton. Yes, uh, they would have been doing whale blubber before they would have been doing coal. Okay, so coal is what, and I, th I heard, Freddie, you mentioned it. So remember when we made our English towns, um, coal was a big part of those. Of the Matthew, Mick, you're going to have to, like, keep yourself on mute because... I keep on hearing stuff from your video. All right. Not only that, but you're going to see Austria-Hungary end up being divided in half. Russia's going to lose all of their land for getting out early. Russia was on the winning side, remember, but uh, they ended up leaving early. Why did Russia leave the war early? Weren't they, weren't they like losing a lot of men? Not hungry? They were losing a ton of men. And so they ended up having a revolution. We haven't gotten into communism yet, but they had a communist revolution and they overthrew and they overthrew their own government. We may end up having to skip over the Russian Revolution, y'all. We may just go straight to World War II. Zane looks like one of those gamers you'd see that's like number ranked like top top 10 in the world. I haven't played a lot of power. You're, what, what's going on back there? Your dog's going crazy. Uh, they're about to go. So. Okay. They're excited. All right. How many dogs? Sounds like a lot. Uh, that was just one making noise. God, wait. 
What kind? Beagle and then uh, dachshund. Okay. Uh, beagles are noisy. Yeah, very. <clears throat> dachshunds are noisy too. Ours is old though, so she doesn't really do anything. Uh, I see. All right, uh, let's move on. Um, so, so what ends up happening here? Um, remember, who came up with most of the Treaty of Versailles? Who came up with most of the ideas? Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. And so what we're going to discuss is kind of one of the great ironies of history, right? Um, is that even though Woodrow Wilson, the U.S. president, comes up with a lot of the ideas behind the Treaty of Versailles, it's going to be the United States that ends up rejecting it. And, you, and, and Woodrow Wilson can be blamed a great deal for that, okay? It's, it's, mas it's, mostly, it's mostly his fault, okay? So um, Wilson's big mistake is not going over the 14 points with Congress first. So let's get into a little bit of U.S. politics. We don't much so much talk about the U.S., and, and we won't for another couple of years until you guys are in my government class. Um, but what, um, in, in the treaty-making process, uh, between President Trump and Congress, who's responsible for making the treaty? Two options. Congress? Congress? Nope. It's always the president and like the secretary of state. They're going to work together. They're going to, they're going to cobble out some form of treaty with the other country. But what is Congress's role in that whole process? They approve the treaty once it's like written. Yes, they're going to approve it. Specifically, that's the Senate's responsibility. And so Con Wilson makes this treaty. He, um, you know, spends a lot of time, makes it, but doesn't ever show it to Congress. And so, I mean, Congress knows he's putting this together. They even know what the points, you know, what the major points are. So when Wilson goes over to Paris, um, Congress becomes a little resentful. And they immediately start going to work bad-mouthing the president, bad-mouthing his treaty, and stirring up major opposition. So let's talk, let's talk about what sort of problems they had with it. Uh, one, they're resentful over being left out. But they're also resentful over something else. Um, one of Wilson's big ideas was that the League of Nations would vote, a majority vote, as to whether to send troops to war or not. Why would U.S. Why would US citizens have a problem with the League of Nations sending people to war? We would lose, we would lose a lot of men. There are men. So they don't want some French ambassador sending U.S. troops to war. The U.S. had stayed out of World War I altogether. They had avoided it, right? They had avoided uh, everything having to do with, with World War I. Um, so they had, a real, they had a real problem with um, um, the idea that, hey, it could be a foreign country that would end up putting U.S. lives at risk. So they rejected the League of Nations because of the idea that it could lead to involvement in foreign wars. So the Treaty of Versailles was really, because the U.S. doesn't, so, so Wilson goes to Europe, he presents this to the European people, to all the different nations, Britain, France, whatever. They love it, they think it's great, and, you know, what ends up happening is they end up, um, uh, he comes back to the United States, they hold, they hold parades for him and all this other stuff. He goes back to the United States and he finds out that Congress is not going to approve the treaty that he's worked so hard on. And so this is why, guys, the Treaty of Versailles is doomed to fail. Because the biggest player in the world at this point in time, the United States, has been left out entirely. Um, and it's going to leave this legacy of hate with um, and this legacy of hate, this legacy of bitterness with Germany. And we got one more slide to go after this, guys, so just bear with me.
this legacy of hate that we're talking about. So Germany's going to be all upset. They're going to be all sour because they got to take blame for the war. That democratic government is going to end up failing. Who is that going to lead room for a few years later? In Germany. If the, if the democratic Hitler. government failed, Hitler. Hitler's going to come in. And Freddie, what was Hitler's big selling point? How did Hitler sell himself to the German people as a leader? What did he say he was going to do? He was going to get all their land back and like become as powerful as they were. Exactly. He's going to restore their greatness. And so you could say, and I don't think it's a stretch to argue, that the Treaty of Versailles paved the way for a guy like Hitler to come to power and to um, and to cause the problems that he ended up causing. So, you know, while they meant for this to be the war to end all wars, it ended up becoming anything but, okay? So let's see here. Clear. Oh, Zane, doing little doing little hearts all over the power port, are we? Oh, oh boy. Zane thought he was slick over there. All right. Um, so this is this is it, guys. Um, the legacy of World War One. Europe was in ruins. You know, they had they had cities and towns that now look like they are Roman ruins. They are just completely destroyed. Um, you have. Uh, large areas of land that will never end up being the same even today. Most of this is in France. Uh, but the worst part is that every single European country is pretty much a shell of its old self. And the only real power now at this point in time, and this is a new world power, and for the first time they're going to emerge, and I think it's appropriate that Matthew Mick tell us who that power is, Matthew, what new world power do we have on the world stage? After World War One? Yeah. Yeah. Um a bit of the US. Yeah, there he is with his American flag in the background, and I think those are guns. Yeah, so you know those Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. they are. Keep yourself safe. Second Amendment rights. There we go. Okay, so, um, you know, with, with that, yes, America is going to be the new power on the world stage. So I'm going to do a quick exercise for you guys, and then we're going we're gonna, to, um, we'll call it a day. Just keep your eye out for that test. So just to kind of give you an idea of how awful this was, um, there are 10 of you guys, right? So me, Freddie, Mackay, and Nathan. We all died in World War I, okay? If we all, if, if we as a class represent the young men of Europe, Freddie, me, Mackay, and Nathan died. About 40% of, of Europe's young men. Trey, Zane, Josh Davis, you guys are going to be seriously maimed. And I'm not injured, okay? And I'm not talking about a pulled groin, okay? I'm talking about you've lost a leg or you're blind, right? Like life altering injury. That leaves Kendall, Aaron, and Matthew Mick as the survivors. But so congratulations, guys. You guys have uh, PTSD and have and or live the rest of your uh, lives with the with the memories of all the horrors and the atrocities that you experience. 
So this was a lost generation of young men. And so Winston Churchill says it best, there aren't any real winners. Even though Britain and France won, everybody lost, maybe save the United States. So guys, that is World War I. Um, I have, I've kept you up to 1250, so you're welcome to go once you get this down. Again, keep your eye out with your email on for that test. If you have questions, stick around after, please. Yeah, Coach. All right. See you, Coach. See you later. See you later. See you, Coach. See you later.